Hello and welcome to this CNBC Africa special panel discussion on discussing the big issues of impacting Nigeria's power sector and preferring a way forward. I'm Wale Famrewad. Nigeria's power sector is plagued with a myriad of challenges ranging from underfunding to pipeline vandalism to underdevelopment in general. So the big question is where do we go from here? Joining us to prefer solutions are Olushola Lawson, Regional Director, AIIM, Aditola Ade Bayi, the Executive Director for General Business at Leadway Assurance, Robert Grant, Senior Vice President, Project and Structured Finance at FCMB, and Wally Shonibare, Managing Director and CEO at Shonibare Consulting. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us for this very important conversation. Looking back at how far we've gone with the power reforms, many are so disappointed at where we are today. Generation is still pretty much where it was two years ago. We haven't moved forward in that respect. So many challenges with respect to generation, distribution, and of course, transmission. And maybe I'll start with you, Shola, and if we can just take stock and your perspective on how we got here and what you think is wrong with the system as it currently structured. Okay, thanks. Look, I mean, I think if you look back at the reform in the sector, it's actually happened in Nigeria quicker than it's happened in quite a few of the countries globally. So we can actually, um, if we want to pat ourselves in the back, we've actually privatized an industry with 19 different assets yeah. in very quick time. Mm -hmm. And we've actually managed to attract some international investors into the space. So with the Azura Power Project that we invested in that closed at the end of, of last year. So it's not all bad? It's not all I bad. See, it was a $900 million dollar financing from international investors that came in. So th that's the positives. The negatives are, we've got a long way to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, from the perspective of an equity investor, what are the sort of, what's the main issue impacting the industry? And, and I have to say it's distribution tariffs. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that there is no money currently flowing through the value chain um, certainly not enough to cover the cost of the distribution companies. And then when you layer on top of that all the other um, parts of the, of the value chain, mm -hmm. you find out that you have to fix um, those downstream tariffs. And you know, with the current court case, it's, it's, it's unclear as to which way uh, the, that will go. Right. Wale, do you agree that tariffs are the, are the center of the problem or is there anything else you think is a big issue here? Yes, I agree 100%. Uh, tariffs are a big part of it, but there are other issues, again, uh, at the distribution end because collection is a, is a big uh, problem. Mm. You know, they're not, the discos are not collecting enough. Mm. They're not rolling out the, the meters fast enough uh, because that's what's going to increase the efficiency of collections. And there's also theft that, um, I, you know, I was just talking earlier that in India they have... Uh, emergency courts to deal with electricity theft mm. and we have to bring the weight of government behind it. Uh, unfortunately some of the biggest culprits are also related to government. Mm. Um, you know some of the discos will tell you that the um, largest debtors in, in some are, are you know government parastatals. Right. So that needs to be addressed because that's the oxygen the, the value chain requires for it right. all to function. Right. Robert, do you want to share your perspective on this? Uh, how did we get here and what for you is the biggest challenge that we have to overcome? I think the biggest challenge is the value chain. If mm -hmm. it was just one part of the value chain that was problematic, we could tr focus on you know, the other part, that but the entire see. value chain from gas to transmission to distribution to generation. So the question is which one do you focus on first? And mm -hmm. I think that to Shola's point, um, we try to digest the entire sector in one fell swoop in the privatization, not realizing that the problems that uh, beset the sector were bigger than we thought they were. Mm. And the other part of it is the funding, because all of this requires money. And when they privatized, um, they quickly realized that the business model they thought they had, uh, the business model they used to run the privatization wasn't quite as robust as they thought it was. So they had to take a bit of a break to refine that and then come back to the market. So I think that there was a, uh, there were expectations that were put on these new owners to quickly turn this problem around. But this problem has been brewing for the last 45 years. Mm. And it doesn't self-correct overnight and requires a huge amount of capital. But equally so, all the capital that is required to do it is not going to be sourced locally. So it's a combination of problems. It's the, it's the problem of the legacy issues, 
but it's also the capital required to fix the sector, and that is really a Herculean task. Would you say we're at a breaking point now? Because the stress is all over the place. The banks are under pressure. The generation companies, we, we heard of Transcor reporting recently that they're owed 28 billion Naira. Uh, uh, it's, it's absolutely amazing how companies are able to survive under this environment. And of course, you just mentioned about the tariffs and you've talked about theft of electricity. Would you say we're at that breaking point now that something significant has to be done before the whole system collapses? I think that's a correct statement. We're very close to that inflection point because initially gas was not a problem, now gas is a problem. Mm. Or the availability of gas is a problem. The financiers who financed the initial privatization, they're also in a very difficult space. So I think that for things to move forward, there needs to be a collective discussion amongst regulators, operators, banks and everyone needs to, to sit at the table and understand what needs to be done to fix this because it can't be the banks alone, it can't be the regulator alone. Everyone has to recognize that this problem is really a problem of our own making and we have to figure out how to fix it because it will not self-correct. Right, so the banks obviously are a big part of how financial services are connected to this, but let's speak to um, Leadway Assurance. You obviously in the insurance space and the pensions arena that really should be providing the long-term funding that the sector needs but unfortunately that hasn't happened so as an if you like as an investor and someone who is providing um, underwriting services to this space what for you is the big thing that needs to be fixed to attract that that flow of capital um, I think what is important is for the funding itself to be packaged for the local pension industry mm. Uh, because beyond pension, um, also you have life companies that sell annuity. And annuity companies require long-term uh, assets to back the liabilities they've taken on. So if the banking sector works together with the um, other um, financial sector providers, I would um, say that perhaps we can get the funding in because it's not just about attracting um, foreign direct investment into Nigeria. It's really more about also looking at the local space and talking to pension funds and talking to insurance companies mm -hmm. and you know structuring a deal that they can take on because they also have regulatory requirements to meet in terms of the assets that they owed. Right. But really the need for the need and the demand for long term assets is actually there. It's just for, for us to, to to look at it and work right. it out. So there's a structuring issue. I'm sure we'll discuss that later on. But Shola, um, the Africa Infrastructure Investment manage, Investor manager, Managers obviously is, is looking at this space to bring capital this way. Um, can you reflect on that point as well? I hear very often about um, projects not being bankable, um, do, do, but we continue to hear about this several years into these reforms. Yeah. Have things improved at all in your view or are things getting worse? I think if you go back to December 2015, so we, the, the Azura project was a project that um, we were on the equity side. It was uh, a large project. It was the first greenfield um, non-recourse financing um, in the power sector for probably, what, 15 years in Nigeria since the AES budge. So when that deal closed in December, mm. there were high hopes that you know, very quickly there'll be a number of other projects um, that will follow. Unfortunately, that has not happened. Now, um, if you go back to the question of, of, of bankability, um, Robert made the point that the whole value chain has to stack up. I mean, ideally, we don't want to be in a world where we're structuring guarantees for every single project that we look at. Right. The, the, the fundamentals of the value chain have to make sense. And for mm -hmm. me, that that starts with the getting tariff. money into the system. And ultimately, the consumer has to be the person who pays for the power that, it, that they consume mm. at a cost that is enough to pay lenders, to pay equity providers, and, and to pay the cost of maintaining and operating the system. It, it's right. a simple fact. So until we get our heads around that concept, um, then we're going to keep patching up and putting bandages on, a, on an ill patient right. rather than... Uh, uh, trying to actually cure the sickness. I hear you. So the financiers are obviously here. And Wally, I want you to reflect on how we begin that process. It's obviously a very huge sector. So we have generation, distribution, transmission. And in getting it fixed, wh where do we start? We, he's spoken of the tariffs. That's very 
fundamental clearly. Mm -hmm. But in breaking it down, maybe starting with the generation companies, mm -hmm. what more can we do to help the gener the Gencos mm -hmm. really get mm -hmm. going? Well, you know, the problem is multifaceted and it mm -hmm. has to be addressed in parallel. There are a lot of different work streams that need to go on. So mm -hmm. initially we had the problem of the legacy debts that yeah. needed to be addressed. So you had the CBN come and put together an intervention fund, but then they had to stop the disbursement of that intervention fund because they, they felt that it wasn't being properly operated. Mm -hmm. uh, the um, accounts that should have been opened, et cetera, were not opened. And, and so they needed to stop uh, and reflect, but again, we look at the transmission side and people are saying, well, transmission is still under government control and the uh, transmission company of Nigeria doesn't have the funds required to invest in trans transmission. Maybe there's still further restructuring to go on on the transmission side, for instance, to get more money in. in for instance, the national grid of Great Britain is listed on the stock exchange there. Right. So you know, you can, to you consider, can, obviously. Yeah, you can Even securitize the, the, the revenues of TCN. So the financial engineering has not stopped yet. Okay. On the gas side, um, you know, now we're getting more investment into the gas sector, thankfully. But some of those reforms need to continue because there's also a gas tariff issue mm -hmm. that needs to be looked at to make sure that it continues to be cost reflective. Mm -hmm. And then on the distribution side, there are solutions that can be put in place to accelerate the rollout of meters, mm. you know, of metering. You know, uh, when the UK privatized the rail sector, there were no rolling stock leasing companies in that country. Mm. But through, you know, government uh, financial engineering working with the private sector, you created those companies. We could have a national leasing solution to, for metering to mm. help the faster rollout. So, it's something that requires everybody to come together, like Robert said, and look at a holistic solution right. rather than putting, you know, small patches. Right. Right. <laughs> over, I, yeah. I think well, you make well, a very the, interesting point, uh, and like you said, industry. Yeah. Like you said, Robert has made that point. There is a need to come together, and one must imagine that the government really needs to drive that process, even though the private sector will continue to speak and you know advocate for this, um, because the government to the to a large extent, especially because they provide the regulator, they really need to lead the process. But um, I, I want you to begin to reflect on maybe some of the interesting transactions that have happened recently. So we've seen um, PPA signed for renewable energy. Solar, it sounds very exciting. It seems like the way to go. But can you reflect on that, those transactions? Because one point I have heard um, mentioned is that not too many of those um, guys are going to be able to deliver, partly because of the structure of the entire industry and, of course, the big problem with transmission. Um, that's a challenging question. Let me try to take this. <laughs> no, I know I there's a lot in there. Having balance in your energy policy is important. You can have thermal, you can have solar, you can have renewable, you can have renewable and thermal. But we haven't resolved the thermal side yet. Mm -hmm. So we haven't, you know, as Wally said, you know, the you said there's 28 billion owing, there's another company that's owed quite a bit more. I think you try to fix that or get that along the way mm -hmm. because investors are looking at the existing sector to say, how is that going? So if mm -hmm. you want to lay on top of that now, the renewable sector without fixing the thermal sector, mm -hmm. it gets a bit complicated because right. at the end of the day, it's still one regulator. Right. So I think, you know, it's important to recognize that there is, there is the need to have a, a diversity in your energy. But I think that where we are now is to try to now bring renewable in when you haven't fixed some of the tariff issues or some of the structural issues will make it a lot more complicated. Mm. Um, it's important to recognize that renewable is good because it, it, it delivers faster to the grid in terms of how quickly it can be conceptualized and delivered. Mm. But I think that for me, it's important to fix the first problem, and then you can now try to resolve the second problem. Right. Um, and it has to be done in parallel. Um, the key thing now is, you know, do the tariffs that they propose make sense for the potential investors in that sector? Mm. I think the jury's still out on that. It's mm. a familiar deal with tariffs. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> look, I mean, I think on, on solar, particularly for Nigeria, it's an absolute no-brainer. I mean, we have 
very good irradiation levels. There's a part of the country where you can't get gas to. It's a no-brainer. We have to have solar. However, in the context of energy production and delivery in Nigeria, it's, it's, a, it's a minuscule amount. So even the 14 PPAs that they've signed, the aggregate, the maximum um, sorry, total capacity of all those plants is probably, what, 500 megawatts? When you factor in that solar plants run a, on a 20% cap factor, you're getting the equivalent of 100 megawatts. Now, this is a, a power system that needs 20,000 megawatts. So, look, I mean, it has to happen. But even, even, it's, it's, even the 14 it's projects, significant it's, it's step, significant, I think, but it's, to begin it's to think tiny about it in the context of what is required. So solar is never going to provide the base load that this country requires, which is why let's not spend um, a disproportionate amount of our energy trying to focus on effectively 100 megawatts of power onto the grid when we need 20,000. Mm -hmm. But, but it's, 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 it's absolutely the right way to go. In terms of um, will all these projects get done, I think I'd like to take the example of South Africa, which launched a, a very successful REIPP program. I think they started about five years ago, and they, they tended out um, about 6,500 megawatts of capacity. They've attracted something like $15 billion into the renewable energy sector. Mm -hmm. And they did it through uh, an open auction. So they allocated a certain number of megawatts for each type of plant. They allowed people to bid in. And then they, they um, over several rounds, you saw tariffs go from something like $0.28 cents a kilowatt hour in the first round mm -hmm. to today's tariff of in solar is something like nine or ten cents. So you've seen a massive contraction when people have got comfortable with the country and the ability of contractors to deliver. You don't artificially, well, I'm not saying you don't, but it's, it's harder to artificially put a price on something which has not been done before. So the jury is out as to whether or um, all these projects will close. I think in any market, you'd expect the initial projects to be priced slightly higher. There'll be a small premium. And then as you have more projects coming on the grid, you should see that tariff um, drop naturally. But um, a bit cautious, we should be quite cautious around setting artificial rates without any kind of market testing. Right. Yeah, I think just to make that point, ESCOM was yeah. a well-perceived regulator. Exactly. Mm. You know, they were very well-perceived in terms of their ability to do the, the bidding and, the, and manage the entire process. So I think that gave investors comfort that mm -hmm. they would be able to generate sufficient returns. So right. that's Tola, you want to make a point? Yes. Um, and the point is, talking about the uh, renewable energy and also the um, contribution of solar, that maybe we should not dismiss it. Rather than dismiss it, to actually look at how can that also um, help in terms of delivering power because it's almost like a vicious circle, as we were discussing earlier, that you need to resolve the power problem. If you don't resolve the power problem, the economy doesn't move. So mm. whatever little benefit we get even from solar becomes important as well. I agree 100%. And then, you know, from, from uh, an insurance perspective and from sustainability perspective, mm. you know, insurance companies do like uh, for new buildings coming up to actually integrate uh, renewable energy into their building plans so that you depend less on the uh, public source of power, the mm. more popular source of power, mm. so to speak. And really, if we adopt a modular approach to how we see the power problem, maybe we'll actually solve it faster than just looking at solving the main. Mm. So this part solves on the solar side, then we have the wind, then we have also of other parts as well that are being developed because within Nigeria, I, I learned, I, I think about two years ago, there was talk of, um, uh, nuclear power, of course, has been dismissed now. But mm. I mean, it was also it was an idea that was broached by government. And I think um, from a risk perspective, they wanted to see how insurance companies react, react to it. Right. And you know, it didn't take off the ground because really you have more, less volatile type power production. Um, nuclear power is meant to be clean, but you know, really, do you want to do you want to go there? So it never took, got off the ground. But at least you have the solar, you have the wind, and insurance companies are being encouraged also to encourage customers to look at that in terms of long-term sustainability um, of um, the green power, green energy projects. Right. Um, in terms of preferring solutions, I want us to start now by focusing a little more on the generation side, uh, generating side of the, of the value chain. 
And so, as we mentioned, quite a few of these companies are owed significant amounts. They're having challenges with gas supply. Um, obviously, we've talked about the importance to get everyone in the room to try and fix this. But maybe we can start from here. Uh, maybe starting with you, Wale, how do we begin to resolve the issues around the GENCOs? Um, they're owed huge amounts. Uh, I actually got the impression that NBET was reasonably capitalized. So it's a bit surprising that we're having this happen. NBET is capitalized, but we shouldn't confuse that capitalization with mm. paying bills because, you know, that's NBET's capital. Right. Now, <laughs> there's the, 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 system, yeah, the system I itself. The system itself still has to pay its bills. Mm -hmm. So that's why the entire value chain needs to make sense. But it was supposed but, to really de risk. Mm -hmm. It was part of the, the risking of the sector, and it doesn't seem to be working well, exactly like it was. The, the privatization designed. would not have happened if, it didn't we, if we didn't have embed. Because you, some of us recall that um, in the early days of Obasa Joe's government, in the, um, when they first came in, uh, Laya Limoke, when he was uh, minister for power then, yeah. tried to get the privatization thing going. It couldn't happen. It couldn't happen. So until the Power Sector Reform Act uh, was passed in 2005 um, with the creation of MBET, et cetera, et cetera, you couldn't even get investors interested because you needed a credit worthy off-taker for mm. the power. Mm. So MBET is, is serving a useful role, but there's no denying the fact that there isn't sufficient money in the system. Mm. But to get sufficient money in the system, um, you also need investment, so it becomes a catch-22. Mm. And one of the key things, um, you know, just referring back to what Tola was saying earlier, is these companies, these new power companies, as quickly as possible, we need to be able to take them to the market. Right. Yeah, because you want to, the capital markets, it's the most natural place to raise long-term money. So many of these companies, the discos, et cetera, they hadn't published accounts for years when they were under government control. Mm. We're now getting to the point where very soon they're going to have three years' worth of accounts. The privatization was completed in 2013. Mm. Once you start to have that, you have the basis to start taking some of these companies to the capital markets. Mm. Then the pension funds, the insurance companies can buy their equity. Did you, you know, attract that's, capital that's, to the ca sector? That's permanent capital. Yeah? They can issue bonds. You know? So they still have some cash. We're just saying the cash isn't enough, you know. So mm -hmm. they can issue bonds, invest. They they start to get ratings. But what about those bills that they are owed by NBET? Does NBET, for instance, have, need to issue a bond to pay its debt? So I, I'm just trying to there's, understand how we fix that. Part. There's no reason why NBET can't issue a bond. There's no reason why TCN cannot issue a bond. All mm -hmm. those things have to be properly structured. Right. When those things are structured, though, you can have ratings. The bonds can be rated. Then the pension funds feel comfortable to invest because mm -hmm. if it's credit enhanced, it could be by a guarantee or some other form. And there are even international institutions who would credit enhance some of these instruments. Um, the, the pension funds, the insurance companies can, can buy those instruments. Mm -hmm. And you, you take the focus off the banks. You know, there's too much pressure and focus on the banking sector. Mm -hmm. The banking, commercial banks are not the natural place to fund long-term investment. Right. It should be the capital markets. So, so we need to integrate the capital markets into the discussion on the power sector. And that's not being done. Hmm. You know? Robert, I want you yeah. to add your voice to this point, how we fix the issues impacting the GENCOs. And then maybe you can also speak to how we bring some relief to the banks as well. Because it is a challenge for the banks too. Well, I think that I, I will endorse everything that Wally has said. Hmm. Um, I think that, unfortunately, when the sector was privatized, it was the banks that did most of the heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. So I think we now need to reflect on that and say, how do we now bring sustainable long-term capital into the sector? What I can say, I, I want to make uh, Shala's point as well, is that, you know, in terms of getting investors to come into this market, if you have well-structured, well-articulated transactions, investors will come, because just because of Nigeria's natural size. So I think the real challenge is, again, there needs to be a, a sit down with everyone to understand where the pinch points are. Mm -hmm. I think right now people are talking past each other. You know, the banks are blaming, the regulators, everyone is now looking at each other to say what's going on. But I think until there is a drive to understand that we, we've, we, we've arrived here, how do we now exit? I think mm -hmm. that's the key thing. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a discussion around how to get the capital markets involved. 
The banks have, I think the banks should take credit for having started it, but the insurance companies need to now step yeah, in involved. with international investors. And what I can say is that international investors are still looking at Nigeria as a possibility. Despite all the issues, they see the sector as a viable sector, providing we can get our conversation, a narrative around how do we move forward in a more sustainable way. Mm. So I really do believe that there is, there is an upside to this, but the question is who starts the discussion and how do we now get the banks to cooperate with the insurance companies, to cooperate with the credit enhanced, uh, enhancers, and also the World Bank and the IFC. Those DFIs play a large role because they do have long-term money. Right, so I think right. that's important. Uh, all part of trying to de-risk the sector. Exactly. But Tola, maybe you can add your voice to what you would like to see in terms of reforms and um, solutions coming to the uh, gen GENCOs and maybe even the broader power sector that would be able to attract some of that capital that we've been talking about from the insurance companies and the pension funds. Um, what well, is it about the economics of the market? Um, mm. We have the customers. We have people who expect power. We have the fact that if we get power, a lot of the small, medium-scale enterprise owners would also thrive. Um, we have the fact that if the regulatory aspect is also properly um, articulated in a way that perhaps NBET drops out of the picture and possibly reforms to being uh, an inclusive owner rather than a government owned entity mm. you know perhaps that would also um, help because really when you're an investor or you know providing you need to secure third party funds which is what annuity funds or pension funds are it's it's money that belongs to other people mm. you need to look at the fact that returns will be generated annually for a very long time you don't want to also bank or support Maybe I should not use the word bank. You don't want to finance. <laughs> you right. don't want to finance um, a failing entity or an entity that Absolutely. is that is especially going with to pension funds. Exactly, that is going to fail because of some level of government involvement. And you know, we've we've heard earlier about the fact that government also owes a lot of the debt in terms of the distribution companies. So really, if you can, if you can get to a situation where there isn't a government entity that is selling electricity to the discos again, mm. then as well, you see value there. You see the fact that even government institutions, if they don't pay, then cut them off. Then they didn't get light. If they don't get light, they will pay because there isn't a government entity sitting in between the um, providers and the distributors. So I think all the the, the, the economics of the situation, once it's right, and there's proper structure around it as well, pension funds and annuity um, life companies would be much, very much interested because they are looking for long-term assets. Right, and we hear about those trillions of Naira sitting in fixed income instruments. We really need to engage some of that money. We need to take a short break now. We'll take a short break and continue this conversation on how we prefer solutions to fixing Nigeria's power sector problems. We're back in a moment. Welcome back to the CNBC Africa special panel conversation on overcoming the issues impacting Nigeria's power sector and really looking at the way forward. Of course, my guests are Olushola Lawson, Regional Director at the Africa Infrastructure Investment Managers, then Aditola Adigbayi, Adik Bai, he's executive director, general business at Leadway Insurance. Robert Grant, senior vice president, project and structured finance at FCMP Capital Markets. And Wale Shonibare, managing director and CEO at Shonibare Consulting. Thank you so much for staying with me. Um, I want to go back to the Jenkos. One big issue that's impacting them is the supply of gas, which of course has been um, really impacted by all these attacks by the militants. And Wale, maybe we, I can start with you. Can you just speak to the, how significant this is? Because I, I just get the sense that if we don't fix that, there's really nothing we can do in terms of taking the GENCOs forward. Absolutely. It's, it's a huge problem, and it's something that uh, the power minister has also 
um, alluded to in providing the reasons why we've had some of the shutdowns that have occurred uh, very recently. I mean, we all know that the attacks are a political problem mm. which have to be addressed through political solutions. But in parallel with the political solutions, you could also apply technology. Okay. Because um, when there's less of an incentive or when the impact of the uh, explosions is less, then the militants will also stop because they will no longer um, have the desired effect. So I know government is also thinking about bringing in solutions that allow you to store gas on site in some of these power plants, you know, through, uh, um, you know, mo mobile LNG type solutions mm -hmm. that will allow you to be able to store some gas so that um, the minute the pipeline gets blown up, it doesn't mean the whole system has to shut down. You, right. can, you can continue to, at least yeah, time. at least for some time uh, in the hope that you can fix the pipeline and the gas uh, comes on board as well. So there's technology that allows you to do that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, it's not the most ideal solution and it probably drives up the cost of the electricity. It's Somebody has right. to pay for it. Mm -hmm. But if people are saying if they don't get electricity, they don't want to pay, perhaps if they get the electricity, then they'll be more willing to pay, <laughs> you know, because, I mean, if you compare it with the cost of self-generation, it probably it's still balances out, yes. And, and you, you get that continuity that many industries require in order to be able to, uh, you know, be profitable. Right. So it's going to be a combination of both technology as well as, you know, the political well, we solutions. We must find a solution. And maybe, Shola, you can, I think, speak to that point again. If that isn't fixed, we really, the, the system really can't move forward, right? Look, I mean, I think the average power that was sent out um, uh, into the grid as of yesterday was something like just over 3,000. Uh, yeah. megawatt hours per hour or 2,000 megawatts in capacity. The constraint from gas is about 4,200. So it's even higher than, than the amount of power being generated. So it's a, it's a critical issue. Yeah. And, and it's probably above my pay grade to uh, profess solutions as to how um, those Niger Delta issues are solved. But, but I think um, the, when you look at some of the incidents that have happened, so for example, the Transfer Cardo's pipeline, which is Shell's key crude evacuation pipeline. It's a crude line. Um, and the actual explosion, the rupture that occurred, was at a sea, was at bottom of the seabed. So these are professional outfits yeah. uh, knowing what they're doing. That line has been down, what, for five months this year? And because, because it's a crude line, so, but because um, the gas, most of the gas being produced in this country is um, associated gas. If you can't evacuate your liquids, your gas is going to be shuttered as well. So it has that effect um, on mm. on power capacity. Right. Um, okay. You want to add a point to this? No, I think that um, it's it's a political solution. We've just got to uh, find because it. you know when they when they damage a gas pipeline, there is nothing to take away from it. Mm. Right? With an oil pipeline, you can scoop up oil and go away. But with gas, it's just a nuisance problem because they're doing it to make a point. I think that um, in other climes, this is a political solution. Right. Um, and unfortunately, fortunately, the gas is in one part of the country and the consumption is in another part of the country. So I think there needs to begin a part of the entire discussion that we have to have sitting around the table is an economic commercial decision, but also a political decision because everyone is being harmed. And as you look at where Nigeria is reserves are going now because there's no export now there isn't the ability to, to increase your reserves so it really is a political solution and unfortunately political solutions don't happen overnight right they take multiple months and weeks and maybe years but you have to start somewhere and say how do I now resolve this problem and I think the reality is that this has been a problem that's been brewing for quite some time mm. it, it's it stopped for a while but now it's back again but the question is what do you do in order in order to make sure that you don't have this problem going forward. Right. It's a difficult one. Uh, uh, when we really started moving forward with these power reforms, the transitional electricity market was supposed to be a, a significant step. And it's quite interesting that we still haven't crossed that. And definitely things are not perfect. We've just spoken about the attacks on um, gas installations and crude oil installations and the impact it's having on the reforms. But how do we look at that again and take 
do we need to revisit how that's supposed to work under the current environment? Um, Wally, maybe you can start. Right. Well, I mean, what does the transitional electricity market mean? It means mean? that all the contracts it's, are it, It's are the point at working. which all the contracts take full effect. You know, so the incentives, the penalties, everything kicks in and everybody along that chain is supposed to deliver in accordance with their obligations under the various contracts, whether it's a PPA or a vesting contract or a gas supply agreement. But the elements to allow all those um, things to fall in place are not there necessarily. So, for instance, if uh, a gas pipeline gets blown up, it means the uh, you know Nigerian gas company NGC yeah, is unable to deliver yeah. on its gas obligations. It ha then it would have penalties to pay to the Genco that it hasn't supplied. But are those penalties being paid? Are they being enforced? I doubt it. So the Genco's then cannot provide the amount of electricity they're supposed to provide. Mm. Then they're supposed to pay penalties to Embed. It goes down the chain, mm. and. And then coming back from the discos, if the discos are not collecting sufficient money, do they have enough money to be able to pay Embed, who has to pay the, you know, the Genco? So as a result of that, although the transitional electricity market officially kicked off on the 1st of February 2015, the former minister, Junaid Nebo, declared uh, you know, that market open, in actual fact, it could not happen because you had to ration the amount of cash in the system. Mm -hmm. So the uh, Jankos were only being paid about 40% of their capacity charge. That's why they're being owed all of this right. money. And the CBN intervention fund was supposed to address all of that, clear all the legacy debts, and allow everybody to start on a, on a clean slate. But that also hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. So it's not a simple question. Um, <laughs> in theory, I mean, it's been declared open, but in practice, it cannot function because there's still things. I think the to environment be. doesn't make it happen right now. So yeah. my question now is, how do we? Wh what do we need to create in the short term? How do we manage the situation until we can um, get a, a very the appropriate environment that we would like to see in Nigeria right now? Maybe Robert. What, what do we do? What do we do? Um, you start to say what you mean and mean what you say. The gov if the government says they're going to do something, they need to do it because all of this creates goodwill. It creates uh, a good feeling about where we're going. So in declaring TEM, as Wally said, declare TEM and mean it we and move that. on. Yeah. I think a big part of this problem is that the government is involved in I think too many sections of this power chain, value chain. Mm. Um, they are they're the sole owners of the transmission grid. So if we are able to collect, pay, produce, if they if and, and increase the generation capacity, if the government doesn't expand transmission, we have a problem. So declaring TEM has many has many implications, but I think declaring TEM would help to at least give people comfort that they can now invest knowing that the contracts, because when you invest in a power sector in the value chain, it's all about the, the, the veracity of those contracts. If people don't believe or if there are no contracts at all, then why would I invest? Because I have no recourse. Mm -hmm. And that to me is a bigger issue. But I think over time, the government needs to pull back a bit because the government is the only buyer of power right now. They are the only person transmitting the power right now. They own the transmission network. So I think when people look at this sector, you know, you have to have credit enhancements and different types of um, credit structures to minimize or negate the government, the perceived government risk. So I think mm. the, the real solution here is to have a dual solution of minimizing government risk, but also having government, while they're there, doing what they're supposed to do and what yeah. they're going to do. Because people want to be confident that if I put money in, there won't be some sort of force majeure situation that I cannot now claw back to to get paid. So I think that's really where we are. Okay, I, I think you make an interesting point. So we still need to make TEM work if we can. We just maybe need to or spend a little more. Or like. something TEM-like. It's something that people can be comfortable around knowing that those contracts will be enforced right. if something happens. All right, because that will attract investors. Correct. All right. yeah. Very interesting point. But I, I do get a sense that it, it's tough for everyone. But the discos are having a really tough time because you made the point earlier that so much of there's so much electricity theft, 
So there's absolutely no way they can totally recoup the value of their investments and all the revenues they should bring in. And I just want you to speak to how we fix the problems for the discos here. Um, do we need stronger laws? You, you suggested something that was happening in India. Maybe a little more en enforcement of the rules could help. But shall I? Maybe you can speak to sure. this point. Um, look, I mean, I think the 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 future of the sector depends on healthy distribution companies bringing um, cash flow at the end of the day because it goes so, to the end because user, ex exactly who generates the exactly, cash exactly exactly so it is absolutely critical to fix the system now um, there's two sides to every story so one side is the disco side and they'll tell you that um, they haven't had cost reflective tariffs over the last two and a half years that they've owned these assets and therefore um, they have not been able to invest. Um, both in, in the capital expenditure required to improve the technical losses on the network, but also in the meters, as, uh, as, uh, as Wally mentioned, in order to be able to deliver lower um, collection losses. So uh, how do you fix it? Um, uh, there has to be some clarity and certainty on the regulatory side, which is this is a tariff mechanism, mm. and this is what's published, and everybody understands it, and it, it works like clockwork. And we all know what's, uh, you know, what the tariff is going to be next year, and the year after, and the year after. Because uh, that's what will attract the investors, right? Ex exactly, because that's the key thing. I mean, you, you had a situation last year where tariffs moved around, they went up, and they came down, then they went to court. And <laughs> it's that sort of difficulty mm. that, uh, that, that means investors are going to be on the sidelines just waiting to see how things shake out. Um, because right. you're, you're not going to take investors. a bet. Let's, let's hear from Peter on this point. I think the, the um, going to court is also part of the um, integrity that um, we need to look at as well. And why do I say that? Because the court was really more about following due process, you know, to um, publishing new tariffs. It wasn't so much about uh, whether or not there was a need to, mm -hmm. to increase tariff. So I think um, uh, within our environment, once investors also begin to see that due processes are followed and things are properly done, it will be one of the checklists items that you tick off to say, yes, I can invest here. Mm. But if anything goes, the investor still will be afraid as well, which mm. means that you know, if, if, if the court hadn't made a pronouncement and anything goes, the investor is going to be concerned that Tomorrow, anything can happen as well, and then we all continue to look at political solutions. So, the more you remove the politics, the more you remove government in involvement, the more you create a structure that enables the market to thrive, the more it becomes interesting to the investor that is going to bring money. Because, mm -hmm. as, as we said, it's, it's all about long term focus. And I know you, you mentioned uh, what can we do in the short term. You know, I'd rather say that. We, need, we still need a long-term approach, but where do we start? And how do we begin to record um, things that we need to do at the base so that the overall structure itself is enhanced and is, is, is worth um, being sold to an investor and is worth the investor also bringing money into it? Right. And I, I want to put this out to everyone. Um, while we definitely have problems today, I think one opportunity that we will unfortunately miss with the power reforms is if we do not get a local industry going. So for instance, we're talking about things like generate um, manufacturing meters and mm -hmm. everything else around the value chain. And I just want you to speak to that point because I think that needs some focus, some government support to get going. Uh, Wally, maybe you want to start. Well, I'm aware of local content guidelines for the power sector. Mm. And we have local uh, meter manufacturers. Uh, you so know. that is happening already? That's, that's happening. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the minister was uh, also visited a factory last week. I saw a, uh, a picture in the papers. Obviously, I mean, I've met uh, investors. I met somebody, in uh, an investor in Washington uh, a, a, a couple of years ago who wanted to come and start manufacturing transmission lines mm -hmm. in, in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And they may have brought that investment. So there is actually appetite, you know, and the, there are conferences that happen every year where different uh, investors come and showcase their wares, whether they're meter manufacturers or transformer manufacturers. Many of those guys are 
uh, partnering with local companies to establish production here. But we have to give them that enabling environment to allow that production. So for instance, if they need Forex to be able to buy parts, to be able to set up their factory, forex, yes. you know, they, they, it, there needs to be some predictability around the av availability of Forex. Otherwise, right. these guys will move to Ghana or some neighboring countries mm -hmm. and, um, you know, although they have Forex problems in Ghana as well, <laughs> but, uh, but, but <laughs> where there's some more structure. So we need to encourage those, those companies to come uh, and stay, you know, for the long term. Right. That's why the rules, everything has to be transparent, clockwork and predictable. Which can't right. be changing things. Right. Uh, it's interesting you brought out the point around Forex because yeah. it is a problem for everybody at the moment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, inc incidentally, the central bank has spoken about maybe prioritizing sectors. And sure. I'm just wondering what, what we can do to help the power sector long term. I, I, you want to speak to this yeah, point? I think, you know, let's take a step back and talk about tariffs. Hmm. Tariffs, cost reflected tariffs are a function of the costs that go into building a power plant. The unfortunate reality, to, to Wally's point, is that everything that is, all the parts that go into building a power plant are imported. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We collect Naira revenues. We have foreign currency obligations. Mm. So if we're able to bring 20% of the manufacturing, be it cables or meters or something, mm. it would certainly reduce the, the tariffs because then you don't have to build this forex component into the tariff. So I think that, again, this is a part of a greater discussion we have to have about not only the sector, but the components of that sector. Because the other part of the problem is that everything has to be manufactured and shipped in. And that takes time. So a lot of times uh, the delays are caused because, because things have to come in. So I think that it's a holistic solution again mm. to, to try to understand how we can ultimately reduce the tariff but also provide a return to investors who want to come into the sector. So right. you can't dismiss any part of this. Everything has to be considered. Mm. But on the Forex side, the big issue is investors need to be repaid in dollars. Mm. We collect an IRA. So again, part of the problem is when they need to be repaid, they need to be, there needs to be some certainty around, I will be able to get my Forex to repay right. my obligations right. at that right. point right. in time. So it's a complicated discussion. Right. And really the government needs to step in to help that because- Correct. Well, it's I, not just the, uh, sorry, if yeah, I go ahead. Dropping, I mean, it's not just the, the, the government and Robert just said, investors need to be paid in dollars. Why? <laughs> I think well, the, the, the well, the capital market solution that Wale offered is, I think is a, is a key point right. here because yeah, okay. in most sustainable power sectors in the world, mm. there's local currency financing, both on the equity side and right. the debt side. I think right. um, we need to almost start thinking of everything in, in, in dollars. Mm. It's a power business in Nigeria. Why are you borrowing in dollars when your revenues are in, are in, are in Naira? So to the extent that we can develop, uh, the local banks are part of the solution, but also the capital markets, right. the PFAs and the insurance companies, long-term local currency financing, that will put relieve some of the stress um, of having to get this FX passed through in the tariff, which is going to cause right. issues. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think that solves um, the um, investor side. But in terms of the equipment, mm -hmm. the actual physical That's equipment still have to be brought in. in I, I, I in do get that sense as well, as well. And which is why I thought I made the point about the government. We know, for instance, the government is looking to raise money, uh, dollars through euro bonds and so forth. Mm -hmm maybe there should be a special bond to help the power sector. Because at the end of the day, if the power sector doesn't get going, the economy really cannot get going. Right. And but it's a different there are so many dollar needs it's relating it's to this yeah. capital. It's to a this different uh, question. Sector. I mean, the, the Forex issue is, is threefold. So the first issue is, can I get my return denominated in, in a currency, mm -hmm. which was the issue that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. There's now a separate issue on convertibility. If I put in dollars, can I take my dollars back out? And then there's a third issue on liquidity. If I need to import machinery, can I get hold of the dollars? Mm. I think you can have one, investors earning narrow returns, but also have still be importing equipment. Mm -hmm. All you do is, if you have um, liquidity and convertibility in the market, you get a narrow loan, you convert it to dollars, and you buy your equipment. Mm -hmm. Simple. So but, it, it, you know, this capital markets thing is, again, very relevant here because 
we started to liberalize our foreign exchange markets, right? There's no reason why, if anyone needs dollars, they shouldn't just be able to go and buy the dollar at the prevailing rate or go and buy a dollar forward, mm -hmm. you know, to, to be able to make sure you get your dollars when you need it. Mm -hmm. But when we try and control and regulate everything, then you're not letting the market fundamentals take effect, you know? Um, when the petrol prices uh, crashed, Kazakhstan devalued immediately, you right. know? They're now coming out of that curve. We waited, <laughs> you know, we didn't want to right. face the evil day. You know, so market fundamentals have to really be allowed to drive right. Well, all, that, all that said, uh, how close do you think we are to another Azura-type transaction? Now that we've seen, to some extent, a liberalization of the market, mm. I, I think those tri type of transactions really speak to the progress that we're making. Yeah. And I wonder if anyone here thinks that we're closer to that in the short term. I, I think the, the issue is going to be around um, can you get the level of support from the federal government in terms of a sovereign guarantee, mm. and then can you also Re be able to reinsure that offshore, which were two critical elements that we had in the Azura deal. And I think you need both of those in place if you're going to get international funding. At the moment, it doesn't seem like uh, our friends in the Nigerian banks uh, uh, have much appetite for the power sector at the moment. So there will need to be some foreign money, um, in which case those two elements have to be in place. Now, from what we hear with the solar um, plants, it looks like um, certain projects will get that support. Right. So I expect to see a number of projects closing in the next 12 to 18 months. Okay, hopefully maybe with some of the renewable projects that sure. we're hearing about. Sure, just on the Azura side, I think that if, if the Azura deal had been delayed into 2016, it probably would not have closed mm. because of all the somersaults we have now with policy. So I think that for another deal to get done, there needs to be some sort of decision made or some sort of understanding on the monetary policy side exactly where the currency level is going to come out. Yeah. I think that is what's really now spooking investors to say, you know, I don't know where it's going to be and now it's been liberalized but we still have a, you know, a two-pronged a two market. So I think once there is some certainty around what's going to happen in the currency markets, mm -hmm. then you'll see investors come in. Um, the government also has to, you know, be a big part of this because there is a sovereign guarantee that has to support this. So it's a combination of things, but I think having certainty around the monetary policy regime is very, very important. Very critical. Just a that. quick point. Um, it's the same Nigerian consumer that pays their telephone bills that also pays for electricity bills. Mm -hmm. And for telephone bills, you don't ask for sovereign guarantee. <laughs> it's the same Nigerian consumer. The key difference is in telecoms, Cost reflective tariffs mm -hmm. are, you know, automatic. Right. There's a transmission mechanism that's almost immediate. That okay. means that so the consumer is seeing the full cost of providing those telecom services. But where you you get meddling, you don't have the cost reflective tariffs. The consumer is not able to. The market transition mechanism doesn't work. That's why mm -hmm. they're asking for sovereign sovereign guarantee. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the same person. It's me. I'm I think, paying the I think bills. you're really reiterating the point about these tariffs. It's really, yes. really crucial in, yeah. in making this work. But, but it's, just, it's, tar it's, just, yeah. it's tariffs, but it's all... I think that if people were assured of getting power 24-7, and the tariff was three times where it is today, assuming that's the case, right. as long as they know they were getting reliable, consistent power, I think they would be somewhat uh, okay with paying the higher tariff, but now you charge the higher tariff, but I don't get the power, yeah. so how do we balance this equation? So I think it's just being able to get consistent service, and people will pay for quality service. Right. Maybe, maybe you charge the high tariff because some people are still in electricity or some so people are not paying. Maybe there's actually no need mm. to mm. charge a higher mm. tariff so because comes I mean, back look, to at, the look at the competition within the, the exactly within the telecoms uh, yes. sector as well. Prices came down initially mm. it was very high, then mm. all of a sudden yes. because of competition, prices right. came down. Yes. So maybe if the people that are meant to pay are paying, you know, the people that are stealing are prevented from stealing. We can't right. really eradicate it. Mm -hmm. Who knows, you know, we'll be there. I mean, we have a large market and uh, beyond people coming in from outside to invest or foreign investors coming in, we, we also have an environment that is also saying, look, we have money to invest. How do we gather ourselves together to actually put money into the real sector 
into the you know into infrastructure into enabling our environment to thrive because once the environment thrives once you have people um, uh, employ people people you know start different types of businesses for which they depend on infrastructure for then even we as um, um, insurance companies as uh, pension companies have more people again to insure so the the the, the, the mm. circle continues and that circle is a very good one because we keep benefiting ourselves so maybe perhaps also we should stop looking at the foreign solution because of the pressure on foreign currency maybe we need to look at internal solution and actually just come together and talk to each other because for a very long time when we're talking financing it's always been you know the banks mainly but they, it's almost as if the insurance industry or the pension industry remains a second or, you know, an afterthought, mm. you know, to the whole um, business of financing uh, infrastructural projects. And I think we need to start looking at that more closely. All right. I need to wrap up, but uh, final point from you? No, no, no. Okay. I, I think just to touch on the pension funds, I mean, there's been, um, while well, I can tell you the number of times that uh, we've all been around, uh, and I think, look, there's a certain amount of education that that still needs to be done before mm -hmm. um, that move eventually occurs. I don't think if you offer them a product today, they'll automatically all come in. Thank you so much. Um, my panel has been really insightful in terms of drilling down into the big issues impacting Nigeria's power sector. We've been discussing the coverage and overcoming the issues affecting Nigeria's power sector and the way forward. Many thanks to my guests, Olushala Lawson, Regional Director at the Africa Infrastructure Investment Managers um, Company. Then we have also have had Adetola Adegbayi, Executive Director, General Business at Leadway Assurance, Robert Grant, Senior Vice President, Project and Structured Finance at FCMB Capital Markets, and Wale Shonibare, Managing Director and CEO at Shonibare Consulting. And thank you for watching.